that evolution, the study of evolution, became so gene-centric in the early part of the 20th century. Darwin talked about heredity, a resemblance between offspring and parents. But before long, it was as if the only way that offspring can resemble their parents is by sharing genes. What happened to culture? David Sloan Wilson is SUNY Distinguished Professor of Biology and Anthropology at Binghamton University, as well as the president of the Evolution Institute and editor-in-chief of their magazine. He is widely known for his fundamental contributions to evolutionary science and for explaining evolution to the general public. He is the author and co-author of many books, including Evolution for Everyone, The Neighborhood Project, Pro-Social, Unto Others, Does Altruism Exist, and Darwin's Cathedral, among others. This evening, he'll be discussing his latest book, This View of Life, Completing the Darwinian Revolution. Peter Gray writes, David Sloan Wilson is a clear-headed, sound-thinking, realistic idealist and a great writer to boot. In this brilliant work, he shows us how an evolutionary worldview can not only help us understand who we are as a species, as individuals, and as a society, but can also help us develop better policies for our long-term good as social beings. We are so pleased to host him here at Harvard Bookstore tonight. Please join me in welcoming David Sloan Wilson. Um, I'm going to um, try to describe the arc of my book and read a few passages, uh, maybe spend half an hour doing that, and then leave plenty of time for Q&A. And actually, you know, if you really feel impelled to ask a question, then then please do, and and then I'll rein you in if, uh, if, uh, if necessary. But uh, so uh, here I'm just going to begin with the start of the introduction. Whatever you think you currently know about evolution, please move it to one side to make room for what I am about to, about to share in the pages of this book. Um, I think you'll find that my argument doesn't fall into any current category. Politically, it isn't left, right, or libertarian. It's not anti-religious and enables us to think more deeply about religion than ever before. Above all, it moves us in the direction of of sustainable living at all scales. Who doesn't want to improve their personal well-being, their families, neighborhoods, schools, and businesses, their governments and economies, and their stewardship of the natural world? These goals are within reach, but only if we see the world through the lens of the right theory. To begin, we need to do a bit of clear thinking on what science is. It's commonly portrayed as a contest between theories that are based on a common stock of observations. First we see, and then we theorize. Theories that do the best job of explaining the observations are accepted, only to be challenged by another round of theories, and and so on, bringing our knowledge of the world closer to reality. The problem with this view of science is that the common stock of observations is nearly infinite. We cannot possibly attend to everything, so a theory, broadly defined as a way of interpreting the world around us, is required to tell us what to pay attention to and what to ignore. We must theorize to see. A new theory doesn't just posit a new interpretation of old observations. It opens the door to new observations to which the old theories were blind. Uh, Einstein is famous for saying the theory decides what we can observe. And Charles Darwin experienced the blindness that comes from the lack of the right theory as a young man on a fossil hunting expedition with his professor, Adam Sedgwick. The valley in Wales that they visited had been scoured by glaciers and therefore had no fossils. The evidence for glaciers lay all around them, the scorched rocks, the perch boulders, the lateral and terminal moraines, all typical of a glaciated landscape. Yet Darwin and Sedgwick were blind to the evidence because the theory that vast sheets of ice had once covered much of the northern hemisphere had not yet been proposed. They didn't know that they should have been, what they should have been looking for. Darwin commented in his autobiography that, A house burnt down by fire did not tell its story more plainly than did this valley. If it had still been filled by a glacier, the phenomenon would have been less distinct than they are now. And so the the idea that the theory decides what we observe, and theory defined broadly as our way of seeing the world, a worldview really is a major theme of the book. And what happens when you don't have uh, evolutionary theory as your worldview, uh, what basically that makes sense of certain things, and the transformation that can occur when you adopt the right um, uh, the right theory, and so uh, and so now uh, this enables me to explain what I mean by completing the Darwinian revolution. 
Uh, let's take stock as we begin our journey. The claim of this book is that a firm knowledge of evolutionary theory, which includes our own species, is required to solve the problems of our age. Yet our current knowledge of humanity and our many attempts to improve our circumstances are to a large extent pre-Darwinian. This claim will probably sound strange to most readers. I am not referring to the collision between evolutionary theory and religious beliefs. I'm not even referring to a conscious denial of evolutionary theory for any reason. These topics can be set aside, at least for the moment. A person can fully endorse a naturalistic view of the world, including the fact of evolution, and still be pre-Darwinian. To explain what I mean, let's return to Darwin and Sedgwick looking for the fossils in that Welsh valley scoured by glaciers. A particular theory was required to make sense of what lay around them. No other theory would do. Our current knowledge of humanity and our many attempts to improve the human condition with public policy consist of hundreds of theories and rationales that are too informal to call theories, but nevertheless draw our attention to some possibilities and blindness to others. Most of them are local theories, which mean that they attempt to explain a limited range of phenomena without pretending to have a more general explanatory scope. They're seldom related to each other or to any general theoretical framework, much less evolutionary theory. This is radically different than the conventional biological sciences, where all topics are approached from a single theoretical perspective. Scientists, scholars, politicians, and policy experts might think that their theories and rationales are consistent with evolutionary theory, but in the absence of explicit inquiry, there is no way to know. When these topics are approached from an evolutionary perspective, massive problems in the way they've been conceptualized are often revealed. A new possibility emerged that in retrospect are so obvious that a house burnt down by fire would not tell its story more plainly. So I want to be clear that my intended audience here are not religious creationists and not even people that are frightened by uh, uh, the specter of social Darwinism on which I have a, uh, a, a chapter, uh, but people, the much larger number of people who are feel fully naturalistic, fully comfortable with um, evolution, uh, but do not apply it to their own lives, do not apply it to their professions. And so therefore it is an article of faith for them that what they think is consistent with evolutionary um, theory. Uh, dozens of examples will be provided in the pages of this book, but consider the economics profession as a foretaste. Don't get me started on, on economics. It includes many schools of thought, but the dominant school is inspired not by Darwin's theory of evolution, but by 19th century physics, as if an economic system can be predicted with the same kind of mathematical precision as the orbits of planet around the sun in our solar system. Even though the Norwegian-American economist Thorstein Veblen wrote an article titled, Why is Economics Not an Evolutionary Science in 1898, the term evolutionary eco uh, economics was not coined until the 1980s, reflecting the more general intellectual apartheid that I already recounted, citing uh, the other Wilson, Edward O. Wilson's book, Sociobiology, 1975, as a kind of a benchmark of a book that was basically hailed as a triumph, a synthetic triumph for the rest of life, but inadmissible for, um, for uh, humans. Uh, today, uh, evolutionary economics is a tiny heterodox school of thought with almost no influence on public policy. One prominent economist who gets it right is Robert Frank, who predicts that within 100 years, Darwin and not Adam Smith will be regarded as the father of economics. If he is correct, then it will have taken over two centuries to complete the Darwinian revolution for this topic, and we're still only a little more than halfway there. Things much must go faster. And so um, after a chapter on social Darwinism, showing basically that it is uh, in large uh, measure a, bo a boogeyman, a bogeyman, and that uh, what has always meant from the beginning, that phrase, has been basically a critique of laissez-faire policies of all sorts. Any, any effort to, uh, whereby the strong benefits from the weak is called social Darwinist. Uh, it is uh, always someone that you pin on somebody else, nothing that you ever call yourself. Uh, those who are called social Darwinists, Darwinists seldom invoke Dar uh, Darwin. Uh, a former President Obama used to love the phrase for his Republican opponents, and isn't that funny because uh, uh, that they would use Darwin's theory to justify their uh, tax um, 
uh, uh, tax policies and so on and uh, and uh, uh, so forth. Of course, yes, yes, evolution has been used to justify inequality, but just so also have so many other uh, uh, theories and and worldviews. And the whole idea of blaming uh, the originator of an idea uh, make them morally culpable. Um, anything that can be used as a tool can also be used as a uh, as a weapon. So I think it actually is possible to put the specter of social Darwinism to rest. Another point is is that. Um, if you were to have a contest for uh, the opposite of the proverbial social Darwinist, uh, very likely the winner would be John Dewey, uh, the beloved uh, uh, philosopher and educator and, and social uh, reformer. But he was a real social Darwinist. Him and the tradition of pragmatism that began with folks such as William James right here at Harvard, uh, the, the, the tradition of pragmatism was inspired by Darwin, and yet uh, no one ever calls it social uh, uh, Darwinism. So it really is easy to get past um, uh, social Darwinism and then try to build a positive uh, worldview around uh, around um, um, evolution. And so the idea that policy is a branch of uh, biology is, um, which sounds strange to a lot of people and kind of shocking. Uh, one way to make it more palatable is to uh, is to uh, is to uh, Nico Tinbergen, who was one of the pioneers of animal behavior research, along with Conrad Lorenz and and Carl von Frisch. And back then, in the first part half of the 20th century, uh, the idea that a behavioral trait could evolve in the same way as an anatomical trait, that we could study the evolution of behaviors in the same way that we publish other um, the same way that we study any other kind of traits, was new and, and controversial. And it wasn't until the 1970s that the idea that we could do this, ethology basically as a branch of biology, is, um, uh, became, uh, became common sense. This was when I became a graduate student in the 1970s. Uh, this was a great period of synthesis and unification. That was when the geneticist Theodosius Jabransky said, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution, and it's when Ed Wilson published Sociobiology. It's when these three gentlemen got the Nobel Prize. And so ecology and evolution and, and behavior, now often talked about with the acronyms EEB and Harvard and, and elsewhere, we're in, the process of, we're in the process of fusing. And so it is now quite, I mean, it's just standard for a biologist to think of, of, of behavior as a branch of biology. And what is a policy? But a behavior. What is a policy but a behavior? And so it is against that background, it makes more sense. And so I, I, I tell three stories in this chapter um, that are arranged in a sequence for a purpose, but why we need to draw upon biology to solve some important policy issue. The first one is to explain why all of us are wearing these, so, so many of us need to wear these glasses? Why is there a, 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 um, an epidemic of uh, myopia? And very quickly, that turns out to be a mismatch. A mismatch between eye development, which evolved against the context of a certain ancestral environment, and a modern environment which deviates from that ancestral environment in such a way that it gives us misshapen eyes. And this begins actually with cataract surgeries that uh, when uh, rarely uh, uh, babies are born with cataracts. And so the cataracts need to be removed, but the question is when to do it. And originally doctors thought we should wait until the, baby, the, 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 the child gets a little bit older to perform the surgery. Uh, but when they did that, that led to a tragic result because they, they um, remained profoundly visually impaired despite the fact that the cause of their blindness had been removed. So what had happened, Eye development requires a continuing interaction between the developing eye, the organ, and the neural processing, visual <laughs> processing, and the environment. It's a, it's a gene-environment interaction from the very beginning. And if you cut that, then you derail the process. Uh, they didn't know that. They learned the hard way. And so now they have a more enlightened policy. And so the same thing. The second story has to do with the... Uh, it's similar in kind, the hygiene hypothesis, the fact that uh, in overly hygienic environments, then that leads to a whole range of inflammatory 
disorders. Why is that? It's because our developing immune system needs, always has had, always has developed in the context of a a microbiota, a term, by the way, that wasn't even coined until 2000. Isn't that amazing? We didn't even really get the idea that we're a planet or an ecosystem of microbes until, until so recently. And so an overly hygienic environment, like the environment of, of eye development, is something that never before existed in the history of the vertebrate lineage. And so therefore, the development goes, go, can go, can go uh, haywire. So this is, in the first place, emphasizing the importance of development. And Tinbergen um, is famous for saying that all products of evolution require uh, need four questions to be answered concerning their function, why they evolved, the function they perform, their history, their phylogenetic history, uh, their mechanism, the physical mechanism, and their development, how they come into being during the lifetime of the organism. And Tinbergen's four questions. How many of you have heard of Tinbergen's four questions? Not so many, okay. A few, a few, is really the quickest way to convey this toolkit, this conceptual toolkit for asking any, any questions about any product of evolution. Well, the third story, which is the one I want to concentrate on, begins with a experiment that was done on quail eggs by Robert Lidecker, a developmental biologist, in which, uh, so quail eggs, all bird eggs, uh, sound penetrates the egg before uh, patterned light. And so the auditory system develops before the visual system. And what Lidecker did was cut a window into the egg so that patterned light could get in a few days earlier than it would otherwise. And what happened was, was that visual development was accelerated and it interfered with auditory development so that the offspring could no longer, no longer recognize um, the uh, call of their their mother, and so uh, and so um, um, against this background, consider a product called Belly Buds, a sound system for your unborn child. You like listening to Mozart, the Grateful Dead, and Snoop Dogg, so why deprive your unborn child of the same enjoyment? Or consider Baby Einstein, an entire line of educational products for babies that was started by a former teacher and stay-at-home mom, and is now a division of Walt Disney. Might these seemingly innocent products be like installing a window into a bird's egg? The earnest desire of most parents to do well by their children provides a fine example of the theory determining what we can see. If we want our children to go to college and get good jobs, shouldn't we begin early? Shouldn't we buy them baby Einstein products while they're still in their cribs and start teaching them the three R's in preschool? All of this makes perfect sense when practice makes perfect is our guiding theory just as killing all germs makes sense when we're guided by the wrong version of germ theory. But developmental processes are more complicated than practice makes perfect. As soon as we absorb this fact, then our entire perception of reality changes. That which previously made perfect sense and therefore guided our actions becomes dangerously misinformed. Unlike Bob White quail, humans are an altricial species, which means that a lot of development takes place after birth. Not just sensory development, but emotional, social, sexual, and intellectual development. Given that we're such a behaviorally flexible species, in some respect, development never ends. For thousands upon thousands of generations, human children were born into their societies and developed into functioning adults. An enormous amount of learned information was transmitted across generations. The social environments of our ancestors were diverse, just as visual environments are diverse. For instance, Arctic versus jungle. As with visual environments, however, ancestral human social environments shared enough in common for developmental processes to receive the appropriate environmental inputs and produce functional outputs time after time. Now these inputs are in danger of being disrupted by modern social environments, including well-meaning but misguided efforts to do well by our children. It would be hard to imagine a more important priority for scientific research, but because the problem is largely unrecognized, scientific studies are few and far between. Here is some of the evidence that scientists are beginning to piece together. So here is the evidence that basically the way that our children are being raised is is perhaps causing an epidemic, an epidemic of social and emotional uh, and intellectual um, 
uh, problems. So early acceleration of, of uh, academic training produces short-term results, mod modest short-term results that wash out uh, and then uh, produce lasting deficits in, um, in um, social and intellectual <laughs> development. Uh, and some of you have heard about this. Peter Gray, who is a professor at Boston College, is, uh, is a champion of this. Uh, there's one name. And, and my colleague Jonathan Haidt, and his book, The Coddling of the American Mind, which is a bestseller right now, is, um, is uh, also um, all about this. So I think that what you can see here is, uh, is uh, with these three examples, of it's one that's mundane, you know, and actually pretty easily fixed. And then an uh, inflammatory di uh, uh, disorder is not so easily fixed with a whole spectrum of, of symptoms. And then our, how we raise our our children. The reason I put those three stories in sequence is the first one, that's clearly biological. Okay, you know, policy informed biology will give you that one. But by the time I get to the third one, which is in behavioral, almost entirely behavioral, and policy needs to, to guide, biology needs to have an, have an input there too, that just tells you that actually there, there is no distinction, no meaningful distinction between behavior and anything else. As Tim Bergen and companies said long ago, and that we need to appreciate for ourselves, including our um, public, uh, uh, including the decisions we make, the decisions we make at all levels, as individuals and as as uh, as societies. My time is racing. I know that I'm not going to get through here. So what can I do? Let me. Uh, I'm just going to flash through the again the arc of the book. Uh, um, I have a chapter called "The Problem of Goodness." The idea that harmony and order exist at all scales, such as human societies, the biosphere, and the physical universe, is deeply entrenched in Western thought and many other cultural traditions. It suffuses the Christian worldview and shows up in places that are not typically associated with Christianity, such as economics and complex system science. In Christian thought, the belief that the universe was created by a benign and all-powerful God leads to a conundrum. If true, how can we explain the existence of evil? This is called the problem of evil, and much ink has been spilled by theologians trying to resolve it, including Th Thomas Malthus's belief that famine and disease are divinely imposed to teach virtuous behavior. The evolutionary worldview turns the problem of evil on its head. The behaviors that we associate with evil are easy to explain from an evolutionary perspective because they typically benefit the evildoer at the expense of others. The problem is to explain how the behaviors that people associate with goodness, which typically benefit others in society as a whole, can evolve by a Darwinian process. Much ink has also been spilled by evolutionary thinkers to resolve the problem of goodness. They have made more progress than theologians for the simple reason that evolution provides a better theory of living processes than creationism. And so this chapter is on multi-level selection, the controversial theory of multi-level selection. And in all of my chapters, I try to provide a number of stories and to make them very different from each other and yet addressing the same theme. And in this chapter, the three stories have to do with cancer. And what is cancer but natural selection taking place inside the body? And so uh, cancer cells are selfishness. They would be called evil in, in human terms. And then I have an example that I've used for decades uh, from animal husbandry, or, uh, chicken uh, breeding, and uh, breeding chickens to, uh, to um, um, lay more eggs and uh, how if you do that one way that it actually leads leads to a breed of psychopathic chickens because what in fact you've been selecting for is aggressiveness the most productive hen in each cage is the biggest bully in each cage and so you have to select for the cooperative group and then the third uh, is basically the entire concept of human morality the entire concept of human morality as a set of adaptations that evolve basically for us to function in cooperative groups uh, ancestrally at, the, at a small scale, at the scale of small groups, and then during the last 10,000 years at an increasingly longer, larger, um, larger uh, scale. So we have basically Darwin's toolkit, Tim Bergen's four questions, the problem of goodness, multi-level selection, and then the next expansion must be beyond genetic evolution. And I find it remarkable. I mean, there's a lot of expertise in this room, I know, how, why is it that evolution, the study of evolution, became so gene-centric in the early part of the 20th century? Darwin talked about heredity, a resemblance between offspring 
and parents. But before long, it was as if the only way that offspring can resemble their parents is by sharing genes. What happened to culture? What? And so, thankfully, during the last 30 years or so, we've gotten back on track. That's another point to make, is that completing the Darwinian, completing the Darwinian revolution is not future tense for some people. It is present tense for some people. It is present tense for a pretty large community of people, and a bunch of them are at Harvard. Uh, Joe Henrik would be the one person that I would mention. Well, there's Steve Pinker, there's Robert, there's, there's so many that are actually studying the length and breadth of human behavior from a uh, evolutionary perspective, using the same contextual toolkit, applying it to culture in addition to Genes. Also, there's the evolutionary processes that take place during our lifetime within our own bodies. The immune system, of course, is one of those that we understand very well and provides a fabulous model for thinking about our behavioral system. Okay, our system for behaving as having both an innate component, which does not change during our lifetime, and what we think of as evolutionary psychology kind of represents that, modules and things like that, and an adaptive component that does change during our lifetime, and the whole Skinnerian wing of behaviorism fits into that uh, rubric. So now this toolkit, which developed for genetic evolution, is now being applied to, to such things as individual individuals as evolving systems in their own right. Each and every one of you is an evolving system. And, of course, culture. And now that is something which is present tense for a sizable community, but that community is still a tiny, tiny fraction of the worldwide scholarly and scientific community, and of course, even more so for the policy community. So this is both present tense and future tense at the same time. But I think it's really important to, to uh, say that. Now, what comes next is a trio of chapters on uh, individuals, groups, small groups, and large-scale society. Uh, but the trio is arranged in a sequence for, for a purpose. It begins with uh, small groups, and then from there it goes to individuals, and then to large-scale societies. And, and the reason for that is that I think one of the things that's at stake here is the entire tradition of individualism. The idea that the individual is the fundamental unit of analysis, that we do not understand things until we do so in terms of indi in individual agency. This is called methodological individualism in the social sciences. Homo economicus and economics is one of them. And of course, in everyday life, we have Margaret Thatcher who famously said, there is no such thing as society, only individuals and their families. Now, you don't, if you go back to the first half of the 20th century, you find much more of an emphasis on society as an organism in its own uh, right. You have people like Emile Durkheim and Talcott uh, Parsons, who really, the whole field of sociology used to, was, was founded on the fact that there's something about society that cannot be reduced, cannot be reduced. And the concept of society as an organism in its own right is a venerable metaphor, as you know. It goes all the way back to the Greeks, and we have Hobbes, Leviathan, and so we have words like corporation and body politic. In some ways, it seems like irresistible for us to think about a society as like an organism, but that has been eclipsed by individualism for the last 50 years. And what's new is that now, for the first time, let me be bold, for the first time in the history of human thought, we now have a strong foundation for thinking of the concept of a group as an organism. A group as an organism. And if you're a biologist, you know, there's something called the theory of major evolutionary transitions, that everything that we call an organism did not evolve by individuals evolving from other individuals. It evolved by individuals evolving from groups, groups that became so cooperative that they qualified as a higher level superorganism in its own right. My namesake, Edward O. Wilson, has written books on it. And so this is something which is real. 
And if group selection was important in our species, then we need to be thinking of the group as the functionally organized unit and individuals as entities which typically uh, need to operate in the context of groups and the small group as a fundamental unit of human social organization. The cell, the small group, is the fundamental unit of, of, of human social organization. And so that chapter is titled What All Groups Need, because what all groups need, of course, is to cooperate. And in order to cooperate, they need certain core design principles, which basically suppress the potential for disruptive, self-serving behavior within groups, so that the group can become, that's what a major transition is. And I was honored to work with Eleanor Ostrom, the political scientist who won the Nobel Prize in Economics in 2009. And she worked on the tragedy of the commons, common pool resource groups, and showed that contrary to economic wisdom, some, not all, were able to manage their natural resources all on their own. And she derived eight core design principles that were the, the secrets of their success. And working with her, we generalized those core design principles and showed that actually all groups need these core design principles. Would you like to know what they are? You have to buy the book in order to... <laughs> <laughs> I will tell you the core design uh, principles. What the chapter does is we go through this for type of group after group, for schools, for churches, for businesses. It doesn't matter because in all cases, cooperation is needed. So here is the core design principles. And please think of the groups in your life. Pick a group in mind. It might function well, it might function poorly, and then see if these core design principles are um, relevant. One, the groups that work have a strong sense of identity and purpose. They know that they're a group, they know what the group is about, they know who's in it, and they think it's important. If a group doesn't have that, then... Number two, proportional costs and benefits. It's not sustainable for some members of the group to do all the work and for others to pay the cost. That's the definition of disruptive within group. That's cancerous is what, is what that is. Three, fair and inclusive decision making. If some people are not part of the decision-making process, then that's a recipe for unfairness. It does not have to be strict consensus, but there has to be some sense in which everyone partakes in decision-making. Four, monitoring agreed-upon behavior. If, you know, if we can't even tell whether you're doing what you should or not, then all bets are off. Even if everyone's willing, just as a coordination problem, there needs to be monitoring. Five, graduated sanctions. If you're not doing what you should, it needs to be corrected, need not be mean. A friendly reminder is typically enough, but in some cases you need to escalate. And you need to have positive um, response to good behavior in addition to a negative response to, to, um, to bad behavior. Uh, number six, a fast and fair conflict resolution. Conflicts will occur and they need to be resolved in a way which is uh, respectful and, um, and fast. Number seven, authority to self-govern. Because if a group can't, doesn't have elbow room, to manage their own affairs, then they can't do those other things. And eight, appropriate relations with other groups. Relations among groups must embody the same principles as relations among individuals within groups. So that means that these core design principles are scale independent and they're needed for nations in the global village just as much as for individuals in a real, in a real vision. And so this is a powerful set of uh, ideas. And so if you are lucky enough to be in one or more strong groups that's organized like that, you get two benefits. One is you thrive as an individual because that's your natural environment. Lately, I was just at a, a workshop for therapists, psychotherapists, and I, 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 I told them the parable of the distressed ant. Let's see you go and you see an ant. It's lost its way. It's distressed. It doesn't know what to do. What do you do? Do you work with that ant as an individual? Or do you try to return that ant to the, to the colony? And so many of our problems are basically like the distressed ant. They're problems of loneliness and being solitary and being basically disconnected. disconnected. And the solution is to put that individual back into a strong group. So if you do that, we thrive as individuals. 
and we're much more efficacious as a as a unit than we would be than we would be um, on our on our um, own. And there's wonderful research. I do have to turn to Q and A, but uh, wonderful research by a neuroscientist at uh, Virginia named Jim Cohen. It's worth it. So so uh, um, he was. Uh, but well, basically, he, 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 he has something called s social baseline uh, theory, which means that the one constant in our evolution, we've talked about you know, the, the environment in which eyes develop and the environments in which the immune system developed. The one constant in our ancestral past was to be in, in, in highly cooperative groups. Even when conflict took place, it was mostly between group conflict. And so we've been living in cooperative groups for so long that the brain evolved against that background. When the brain makes its trade-off decisions, it seamlessly integrates personal resources and social resources. And there's an experiment that I describe. It's the last thing that I'll, that I'll uh, uh, describe before we go to, to, go to Q&A. Um, um, Dennis Prophet, a colleague of Jim Cohen. So imagine that uh, we take you to the base of a long hill, and we ask you to estimate its slope. Or you estimate its slope. And we do that under a number of conditions. Um, um, after fasting or having a meal, wearing a heavy backpack or not, or before or having a workout, heavy workout or not. Now, in each of these cases, you've depleted your personal resources. And that would presumably make you less eager to climb the hill. But do you know it actually alters your perception of the hill? <laughs> That's the way we are. So we actually see the hill as steeper or not steeper, depending upon the depletion of our personal resources. Now, in the fourth condition, imagine that either you're alone or you have a friend with you. And so how willing are you to climb that hill and how do you estimate the slope of the hill based on the presence of a friend standing next to you? What that is, is that's your brain factoring in a social resource as seamlessly as its personal resources. That's how much of a colony of a, of a superorganism we are. Our brains are not, our individual brains are much less the isolated unit that we think they are. Uh, much less the homo economicus, the self, the, self, the rational actor. So uh, these are some of the things that at uh, at stake. So with that, with apologies for not letting you have your say yet, now you have your say. Let's first go back to Malthus because he was an inspiration for both Darwin. And the question I would ask you is, let's go back to his problem. His problem is you have a certain amount of food that's growing and the population is growing faster. And the question I would ask you is, as a society that wants to be stable, how do you control that? Well, empirically, we can say that the problem of the population bomb problem is not as great as we thought it was. It appears to be leveling off. Uh, um, I was just talking with Yann Bayam, the uh, uh, head of the uh, uh, New England Complex Systems Institute, uh, um, um, about this. So, uh, so uh, uh, now at the same time, I think that uh, population regulation is w only one form of, of uh, basically collective, collective control, collective self control. So if it's not population size, it's going to be global warming. It's going to be a bunch of other things, which are basically large-scale, ultimately global problems. So I think the, the generalization of your question is, how do we address these global collective uh, problems? And sociological means. I mean, yes, I, I, I understand that the problem is not as big as people thought, because uh, countries are becoming richer, and women want other alternatives. And that is causing another problem, which is the problem that we have and Europe has and Japan has, where you have an, uh, a, a population that is declining in terms of young people, and therefore the question is how do you keep that going? 
Right. It's, the, it's the opposite problem. Rather than overpopulation, underpopulation. So what we can say, and I, we can say it very strongly, I think this is actually one of the main take-home messages at the end of the book, is the logic of multi-level selection is that adaptation at any level of a multi-tier hierarchy of social units, adaptation at any level can, uh, requires a process of selection at that level. This is anti the invisible hand. Requires a process of selection at that level and tends to be undermined by selection at lower levels. And what that leads to, basically, is the necessity of a whole earth ethic. Basically, we must, we must plan our policies with the welfare of the whole earth in mind. That does not mean ignoring the lower level units. It means coordinating the lower level units. And the selection must be policy selection, policy selection. Um, so basically, we must consciously evolve our, our, our future. And this brings up issues which are uh, very controversial among uh, evolutionary uh, thinkers, who I have to say, uh, at least those that remain within evolutionary biology, are very, very timid about a lot of, a lot of questions. And so the whole concept, can evolution be a conscious process, is one that's just like, no, no, please. You know, the whole Weissman doctrine and things like that, that, uh, that basically variation is arbitrary with respect to what gets selected. It's the only, only the environment that gets selected and so on. No, no, no. Um, How can we foster the qualities of groups that you describe, um, given that historically groups have been seen to um, uh, basically to solidify against a common enemy? Um, and, and this used, of course, by the many politicians we won't name today. Yeah. Yeah. So there again is the logic of multi-level selection. A group can be as good as gold as far as its, its uh, members interacting towards each other are concerned, but then do um, harmful things to other groups. Happens all, the, happens all the time. And so you need to make the group pro-social internally, and then you need to make sure that the group is a pro-social actor in larger uh, multi-group ecosystem. This is not this is not theoretical. We've been uh, working for years to develop a practical framework. It's called ProSocial. Uh, look up ProSocial.world, and we are now actually working with groups in real-world settings to implement these core design principles, also to make them more evolvable. Because there's a whole back to psychotherapy. Why do we need therapy, or why do we need why do we need training? Well, in some sense, we feel stuck. We want, to evolve, we want to evolve, we want to get better, and we find it very difficult to do so, and therapy or training is an assisted process for, for doing it. Well, do you know that some of these methods are very successful, and some of the science-based, mindfulness-based, uh, behavior, cognitive, mindfulness-based, therapeutic methods are very, very effective and can work very quickly, and are best seen as managing the, 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 the personal evolutionary process. So you could actually apply that to groups, so you can increase the flexibility of groups. Design principles is what the groups want to become. And then, as a pro-social unit, help them to become cooperative agents at larger up the scale, build up the core design principles up the scale. And we're doing this in a number of contexts, sustainability context, health context, and so on. So it's very, very exciting to be actually, uh, actually doing this, basically, assisting the, um, the process of cultural evolution, becoming wise managers of evolutionary processes. Yeah. Yeah, it seems to me that there are two big crises facing us right now that need to be addressed by policy, that are policy solutions. That would be growing inequality and climate change. And if you believe, they'll accept that there are species specific traits, I don't know that you do or don't. But if you do, which human species specific traits might get in the way of solving those problems, and which ones could we harness in developing effective policies to address them? Well, um, a main message of the book is that evolution is both the solution and the problem. Uh, given what we said about multi level selection and all that, left unmanaged evolution will take us where we don't want to go. In nature and in human life, evolution often results in behaviors that are good for me, not you, us, not them, today, not tomorrow. And so that's what you get. And most of the problems 
that we see as problems, pathological, are, there, are there, there's, there's two categories of dysfunction that can be understood from an evolutionary perspective. One is that these problems are actually adaptive in the evolutionary sense of the word, just not in a way that aligns with our normative goals. So look at nepotism. That's just being nice to your family. Look at corruption. That's just being nice to your friends. Look at selfishness. That's just being nice to yourself. Those aren't bad things, but they have these consequences. Most of the psychological problems that cause people to seek therapy, again, are adaptive in the evolutionary sense of the word. You have something you're trying to flee, you're hide, fight. These are all basically adaptive psychological responses to various adver adversities in your environment. And then something you have to do something in order to actually get the person to, to, to visualize and work towards their valued goals. That's what, that's what mindfulness-based based, um, um, therapy is. So evolution, oh, and then the other source of dysfunction is mismatch, which we've already given some examples of. If you take the hygiene hypothesis, so we grew up, we, so we, we grow up in an overly hygienic environment, we have all these inflammatory disorders, that's not good in any sense of the word. That's just plain flat out maladaptive based on a mismatch. So between mismatches and adaptations that are not aligned with our normative goals, that accounts for like most of the problems that we're encountering. And of course, inequality is, is chief uh, among them. The core design principles are, are equitable big time. And so if you have a, a, a high degree of inequality, then you have violations of the core design principles. That group will not be working well. And so that's the first thing that you need to address. Our global climate change is once again an extremely large scale problem that will continue to exist unless until we could organize at the planetary scale. And there is ways to do that which are not excessively reliant on such things as international treaties and things like that, which actually probably won't won't happen. There's there's bottom up processes that can at least get that going. And Eleanor Ostrom, the same person who uh, um, I drew upon. Um, uh, so much. Uh, her last two papers, actually, one of the last papers she wrote was on uh, global climate change and something called polycentric governance, another thing that she uh, and her husband uh, uh, pioneered. What's that? It says this. Life consists of many spheres of activity. Each sphere has an optimal scale. Optimal governments requires finding the right scale for each sphere of activity and appropriately coordinating among the spheres. And so, based on that kind of principle, you could actually imagine some bottom-up processes where so that basically that, that, that lower-level units, the kind of units that we can actually have some control over, like your neighborhood or yourself or better in a group, um, can actually and actually do something, not just internally, but also, again, efficacious action at a larger scale. And at the end of my book, I talk about an eco-village um, called Dancing Rabbit in Missouri that uh, does an astonishingly good job of, in the first place, um, uh, providing a, a, a wonderful environment for the individual and living a good life on 10% of the resources of the average American at an average salary of $10,000 which gets you abject poverty anyplace else. And so this kind of thing and can meet top down wherever you can find it. And then you can build something up without requiring only global, only global cooperation. So it's not easy, but I do feel that there is actually a kind of a blueprint out there. We know what to do in a, in a sense that we didn't before. Yeah. Is there something in evolutionary theory that would help us understand why things are speeding up so fast since Industrial Revolution? Yeah, that is, um, in the first place, it's a fact, of course. And in the second place, it's technologically driven. And so now uh, we have this extraordinary change where every decade is transfer transformational. And then we need to basically build new evolutionary processes. Here's another point, is that... Uh, is that an inheritance system, what's, what's needed for there to be an evolutionary process? Well, there has to be variation, selection, and replication. But the scale that that takes place 
and the speed that that takes place can be constructed. There's such a thing called the evolution of evolvability. And even our, even our genetic inheritance system is, is, is much more sophisticated than it was when it started out. And so, and our cultural inheritance systems, I mean, what basically what evolved at first only took place at a very small scale. Once again, small group. So at a very small scale, I can notice you're doing something, and you're not, and you seem to be thriving. So I copy you, and I give you respect, and there you go at a small scale. Not so if some school in Topeka, Kansas is doing something well. How am I even going to know about it or spread it or do any of that? And so what we need to do is we need to actually construct the process of cultural evolution so that it can take place at the scale and the speed that it needs to. And that was not possible before the Internet. You could not have a global brain before the Internet. And by the same token, you couldn't have the large-scale society that we do without those other technological advances. Spoken language, which is much more of a cultural adaptation than we thought. Actually, Noam Chomsky was wrong. The idea that there's a language instinct and it's basically a product of genetic evolution. No, it's much more a product of cultural evolution. So spoken language, written language, printing press, those, all of that, all making it possible to basically... Uh, society to exist at a larger scale, but that doesn't mean that it's going to. So the concept of just self-organization, that there's something about complex interactions which results in functional organization just all by itself, absolutely not. That's something that some quite a few complex systems theorists need to, need to learn. The idea that functional organization comes for free and just as some emergent property of complex interactions, absolutely not. It requires a process of selection at that level. And so the pathologies that we see with the internet, we see both the best and the worst. We see so much that we know is pathological. And yet at the same time, we see some amazing, you know, open source co-production reputation systems and so on, which actually make it possible for total strangers to, to interact cooperatively with each other with a high degree of safety. So what these things do is they provide the ingredients, the ingredients for a global brain, a global superorganism, but it has to be constructed. It will never, ever self-organize. And so there's, there's definitely a kind of a utopic outcome, and there is many dystopic outcomes that are, that are uh, possible. At the beginning of my book, I say there is no master navigator. We must be the navigators. And without the compass provided by evolutionary theory, we will surely be lost. Yeah. Uh, given the fast emergence of artificial intelligence and the possibility that in the so not so distant future we become some sort of board, human biological beings, enhance with artificial intelligence capabilities, will this disrupt the paradigm in which evolution works or can be applied to? There is, I mean, there's a number of dystopic scenarios. Uh, one is that, that basically artificial intelligence takes over. Another is that we're the kind of superorganism which, 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 which uh, results in a lot of people just being mindless. Like, you know, nobody wants to be a skin cell or a, or a worker bee, you know, I mean, uh, uh, and so if we're going to be a superorganism, we need to take part in the mentality. We need to be part of the brain of the superorganism. And that's one of the things about the core design principles that's so beautiful, that's so beautiful is that the, end, the third one, fair and inclusive decision-making. Everyone has to take part in the decision-making process. Otherwise, the result would be pathological. So what that does is it encourages all of us to become part of the brain of the, the mentality of the, um, of the um, super uh, organism. So um, I had something else I wanted to say in response to your question, but it's fled my mind, so I need to wait for it. Could you just ask it again, because I did have one more point. I was, I was thinking that it may, because artificial intelligence is so powerful, it is not a paradigm. Yeah, there is a, um, there is a, uh, a wonderful book by Tim O'Reilly, who is a computer pioneer uh, of um, O'Reilly Media. Uh, and uh, the book is cleverly titled WTF question mark, which stands for what's the future and why it's up to us. And uh, 
And that book converges with this book to a remarkable degree. I have an interview with him that's online. Email me and uh, and um, um, and he has a lot of really interesting things to say about uh, artificial intelligence, how it's working, uh, the gig economy, how these Leviathan organizations such as Amazon.com uh, works, and he has a fine sense that in the first place. Unless you unless you have the welfare of the whole system in mind, then forget about it. And so, and that's currently not the case. So, one of the things we have to do is get the Leviathan uh, uh, um, organizations to have the whole system in mind, and then coordinate this. So, so, Amazon's job is not to deliver your package a few hours earlier than now. Its job is actually, you know, the world is your customer is the way that you should be. That you should be putting it, but if you do that, and to some extent still, if you look at Amazon, which with its shrunken goals, okay, uh, still does a great job at their shrunken goals, right? <laughs> I got to admit. Uh, so I mean, it's doing some things well. If you look at how it integrates the artificial intelligence aspect with the human aspect, then you find that it's a good symbiosis. That the that the learning algorithms and so on is basically an evolutionary process at lightning speed, A-B testing and all of this stuff is just going like crazy exploring this territory. So now we have evolution operating as fast as it needs to, back to the point that was made over here. But it's also held accountable by people who are trying to create a very large organization, after all, and doing a good job. They just have to re-earn its mission. And by the same token, if you look at some aspects of the gig economy, I mean, there's something you got to admire about calling an, an Uber or a Lyft, and there it is. I mean, so uh, currently it's inequitable, and it's not, and basically, and, and so it has these inequities. But if 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 these Leviathan companies became enlightened enough in order to be solid citizens, and do you know that is happening? So we have all kinds of examples. There's the B Corp movement, the benefit corporation movement. Uh, there's a foundation in, in Norway that gives out a Nobel Prize for enlightened business uh, leaders. I mean, there are companies that legitimately want to do the right thing. They truly do in the same way that an individual we hope to meet when we meet individuals. We hope to meet those that are truly pro-social. They truly want to do well by it. They exist. They exist. The idea that everything boils down to a form of selfishness is part of the conceit of individualism that we can get over. And so just as there is the truly pro-social individual that, uh, that, that does just fine as long as they manage to surround themselves with other pro-social individuals, a beautiful book by uh, Adam Grant, the business professor at the Wharton School called Give and Take. You know that book? So Adam Grant says, there's three business strategies. There's the givers, give, give, give. There's the takers, take, take, take. And there's the reciprocators. I'll only give if I know that I'm going to get. And he asks, who does best in the business world? And the answer is, the givers do the best and the worst. The best and the worst. When they surround themselves with other givers, the results are spectacular. But when they get surrounded by takers, then they become doormats. And chumps, and isn't that what you would expect from a multi-level evolutionary perspective? And he gives many examples, both from studies and biographies, entertaining biographies of of people. So the prospect for a truly pro-social business or any other entity, a government or any other group-level entity, for succeeding in a Darwinian world is subject to exactly the same dynamics as a pro-social individual. That's why you can take these macro problems and you can shrink them down and get so much insight by asking, you know, what would it be like if this was just an individual in a small group? That's how it is for a company in a, uh, in a, uh, a multi-group economy with its supply chain and, and its customers and all of it. It's an ecosystem of agents. And if those agents can be brought to be, act like individuals, then they can then cooperation can succeed. Time for one more. <laughs> Anyone's got one last question? Sir, um, I'm wondering if you might 
I, I missed the first part of your talk, but it sounds to me like you're making a pretty good argument against reductionist thinking. And to me, it almost seems like you could say that in reductionist thinking is a kind of analog to uh, purely gene-based evolution in the sense that it's the wrong level of selection for policy as gene level evolution is the wrong level selection for all these pernicious scenarios that you've Yes, exactly. Yes, exactly. There's something holistic about natural selection. Natural selection. Here's just a quick example. Uh, I, can pre I can make the prediction that if you go to a desert, most of the species in the desert will be sandy colored. Why? It's because to protect themselves against their predators, uh, to, to conceal themselves from their predators and their prey. Okay, so I did a little bit of natural selection thinking and I didn't need to know anything about the material basis of any of those species. Fact is, those species have different material bases. So snails, insects, mammals, birds, all have different exteriors and different genes. I didn't need to know a bit about any of that. All I needed to do was to make a prediction based on the fact of heritable variation. As long as the physical makeup of the organism results in heritable variation, then it becomes a kind of a malleable clay that gets shaped by selection. All I need to know is the selection part. If that's not holistic, what would be? And so natural selection thinking, the idea that the, that, the, that the parts permit the properties of the whole but do not cause the properties of the whole, that is like the quintessential holistic statement, is exactly what natural selection thinking gives you. And of course, there's a, there's a, a mechanism. So earlier in my talk, I said that this is basically replaces individualism. And here's a final thought. You go back to the early days of, 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 uh, of Durkheim and so on. That was called functionalism. Functionalism. And functionalism basically interpreted societies as good for the society. And ultimately it was rejected because it was like too axiomatic, as if each and every feature of society must be good for the society. And so that was actually, it deserved to be rejected for, for that reason. But what is individualism? but an axiomatic belief that everything has to be, to be uh, rendered in terms of individual self-interest and action. It is just as axiomatic as functionalism. And now what we have is a situation where we have to determine the unit of functional organization on a case-by-case -case basis, depending on the balance between levels of selection. And so for the first time, we can do this in a way which is not axiomatic. It's actually based on just what the evolutionary history is. And so this is, I think, historically, it is, it is truly a replacement for, for, uh, for individualism. And if we want to be historians of science, then if you look what happened in the 19, in the middle of the 20th century, all of these different fields became individualistic at the same time without really being that much connected to each other. And I really think that you can see the individualistic swing in evolutionary biology, the advent of the theory of individual selection, George Williams, adaptation and natural selection, group selection does not exist. And then, um, <laughs> that's my former PhD student right there. Hello, Dan. Um, yeah, she's, I've heard this story before. <laughs> um, selfish gene theory. All basically thought to be so you know, new and true was actually just marching in lockstep with a form of, of individualism which was more or less enveloping the whole culture. And what was driving what? I, I, I actually suspect that the scientific disciplines were some kind of tail being wagged by some bigger cultural dog. And I, I think that uh, I'd really love social historians to, to, uh, to focus on that. Okay, so. That's all we have time for tonight. Thanks, everyone.